So I want to introduce uh, Shane King. Um, Shane is wearing a hat on his head from West Point, but he uh, is an IT security research specialist for RV Cyber Institute, which is at West Point, and um, has a lot of academic history behind him. I won't say, I promise I won't say anything about West Point. Um, and Katie has um, spent a bunch of time both in um, IT customer service and also at the, the KU Medical Center. These guys have a pretty cool um, presentation. I think the topical nature of it around the security of interconnected, internet connected massage devices is we all want to know about it and we don't want to ask it about it. So, <laughs> anyway, guys, take it away. So as you said, my name is Shane, this is Katie. Uh, the topic for this project uh, came from uh, a graduate level uh, research course at the University of Kansas that we took, and we tried to decide <laughs> what to do. Uh, uh, we wanted to pick something that was something that is important to us as security researchers and to the public in general. Uh, we feel like these devices are springing out of nowhere. Um, vibrating out of nowhere, uh, and, they, and they just pop into our lives. So we want to make sure that everyone is aware of what's going on in this realm, and this doesn't just apply to DOMS, it applies to any Bluetooth low energy devices, because uh, you take what we're going to show you here and apply it to almost anything. Um, so, go on to the next one. So, IoT is a uh, buzzword, uh, like cyber, where I work, and um, single pane of glass, whatever else you want to use, AI. So, what, what, what things to think about when we're thinking about the unthinkable? Uh, and the things that came up when we were doing this specific project is, can compromising these devices lead to sexual assault if there aren't proper security controls, or sexual harassment? Um, is the vendor liable? Uh, or can the information in the store be considered protected health information? So we both were at a medical center for a while too, so that was also important. And these are some of the headlines that came up from a lot of devices. Um, you can see that we're not the only ones looking into this, but the internet is no longer just for porn. <laughs> it's now used for way more. So, All right. So, an overview of what we're going to do in this talk is um, we're going to cover our inspiration for this project and then uh, briefly go over another device just to show that like this is prevalent research that's going on and um, then go over our analysis of the personal massage device, um, which is we looked at the app, the Android app, uh, we did Bluetooth analysis, and then we had like mitigations, obviously, and then we'll do a short demo, and then if there's time, uh, go over our short thoughts on privacy and safety. So our influence for this project came from a bigger project called the Internet of Dongs, um, and their mission statement is up here. It's to enhance the privacy and security for um, the IoT market by showing, or telling manufacturers when they're flawed. Um, just like the CBE system, if you do find an issue or a vulnerability in a DOM, you'll get a DBE. <laughs> and, which is something that was really cool is, like, if you do find a DBE, they'll work with the vendor on your behalf, which is nice. Um, and then, so, common problems that we see today in IoT devices and also just general app, like, phone apps, are poor access control, where, like, Obviously, it's connected to the internet directly. Um, and then connectable apps that connect via Bluetooth have a lot of flaws, uh, especially with BLE, because there are security mechanisms that you can implement, but for, like, I don't know, money reasons, people generally don't implement them. Um, and then just general app flaws, like mobile app flaws, so hard-coded default credentials and API keys. Um, insecure implementations of, of your API, and then customer no encryption. And so, here we have 
uh, the Vibes, which we're not talking about the Vibes today specifically. This was just another, uh, I guess, dong that we looked at. Um, but people, some other people had already done research on it prior, so, and they had reported it to the vendor, and the vendor fixed it within a quick amount of time, so like four months. Uh, and it was a pretty big deal that they found, because this one was an, or a dong where like, you could control it remotely through the app as a partner, and so they found a way for like, anyone to just control it through the app, through the chat part of the app. And so here's just a PCAP that we took to show that um, XMPP or the chat protocol is encrypted. Okay, and so here we'll just quickly talk about what we found with the Eyeball app, which is the dong that we analyzed. Um, and then these are just standard tools that we use. So like we had to grab the APK from our phone um, just because it's no longer in the app store or the play store. And then these, the middle, are just what you can use to read the app or the APK file. Um, and then just some common tools in the security community. And then some sandboxes. Okay, and so this is how the eyeball app works, basically. Um, so we can, <laughs> I'll just demo, or we have a device here. Um, as, you, as you notice, that this is not particularly vulgar. It is not shaped like a uh, phallic device. But if yours does look like this, I suggest seeing a doctor. It is, <laughs> it is a KU exerciser, so maybe it's a little bit more fitting. But so, you pair this um, device here with your phone through an app, um, and the app can be obtained from the Apple Store or the vendor's website, which isn't so good because there are some other security issues with that. We all know with Fortnite, you can do what you want, and Google's not really looking at the app. And then, something interesting was, so we did this project um, about a year ago, and then came back and looked just to see if anything had changed. And we found that the app was completely recompiled and renamed and targeted towards a different audience. Um, and so <laughs> now it's advertised as, as a medical device that's been uh, endorsed by medical professionals all over the world. <laughs> okay, and so there's just a diagram again saying, so eyeball connects to the phone, the phone will then it has the app and then send data back to like the eyeball servers. Um, and then these are just some screenshots that we took. So this is an interesting one. Um, they have games that you can play to do your Kegel exercises. And then the next screenshot, so like the second one here, um, that's personal information that you can enter as a user. So some interesting data that stuck out to us was that it asked the age, it asks like when a child was birthed, and um, there are a few others like um, how the child was birthed. So a little personal, but I mean still not too bad. And then okay, so the previous slide also showed you obviously had to have an account to store your data in the app, um, and that's totally fine, but. An issue that we found here was we took a PCAP of the app just to see how it was communicating with the eyeball servers, and they don't implement any encryption really. I mean, the requests that are sent back to the servers are just over clear text. And in addition to that, another no-no is they include the username and password just as URL parameters. Um, and so another thing that you can see here, this is just an example of an account or like an example here of the formatting, but um, the password is not in clear text. It is encrypted with MD, or I mean it is hashed with MD5, but that's easily crackable. So like we have this password here, but we know we were able to crack it and it's password123. And so here's just a PCAP. Um, you can see the request right there. I wish we had a laser pointer. And then, so we did decompile the application, like we said, um, and basically we found that 
the permissions that the app requires or asks for, is, they're not bad. Basically, all of these are needed for the app to work. Um, however, in the new application, for some reason, it collects user data, which I don't know, or I mean user location. I don't know why um, a cake Alexa says your app would need your location at all times. Uh, I mean, I have, a, I, have a, I have a suggestion, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> well, off the top of my head, I wouldn't expect it. Um, and then, just a few other things that we found really quickly are they had open broadcast, broadcast receivers, um, unrestricted Android activities, and then also a hard-coded key in the app, which are all things that shouldn't happen. And so here um, we found also some packages that were unused. So we think that maybe this app was like a template that was taken from something else because we think this is also a knockoff of another DOM. Um, but for example, like this had an un like it had a package for Facebook in here and Alibaba, both of which were not in use, and those have been removed too in the new app. And so here. We're not going to demo this, but this is just like something that we were able to get, um, or just an example of what we found like from pulling users' information. So um, basically, we send a request. So basically, we send a request to the eyeball servers here and get um, a session token. So like, if I'm in the middle and I capture the username and password. I'm able to do that very easily. And then um, here, we were able to get uh, like all of the users' information that they've inserted and saved. And then another interesting thing we were able to pull was, um, so you're able to store a picture for your profile. We were able to query the user's photo, too. And uh, this is our, our good cat here, our good friend's cat. He agreed, this is okay. <laughs> um, some quick fixes that could be implemented are um, like credentials and account information shouldn't be sent in a, in a param as a parameter in the URL. Uh, and then obviously should be sent over HTTPS instead of just clear text HTTP. Um, and then passwords should be salted at the least. Um, and then so, tra or, uh, yeah, that's it. Really so I covered it all. All right. All that, all that wonderful stuff. So next, we're going to go with the Bluetooth analysis. Um, so as a standard, Bluetooth has about a range of 10 meters or 30 feet for American people. Um, so the attack range here is very small. However, um, if you go to a hotel, a lot of people do and they bring their devices so they're not so lonely, is <laughs> they'll use them, right? And if you're in a hotel uh, traveling down, traveling up I-95 and you have dogs with you, you can only stay at like four hotels and the walls are thinner than the toilet paper there. So that's not a, a hindrance if you're anywhere in the building. There's nothing stopping it. So in order to carry off an attack or you, know, you just want to look, we used a couple of different tools and uh, device. So we used the Nordic Semiconductor NR51, NRF51 dongle, um, and uh, we used the Sniffer, a Connect app, Wireshark, and the other thing that you really need is patience. Um, so I'll get into that in a second, but uh, if you're thinking this is just going to work on your first try, you're going to be sad and mistaken, and you're not going to want to do it anymore. But there are some devices that are better than others. Uh, the one that we have listed up in the bullet point um, is, has worked well, better than the other ones. Um, so Bluetooth Low Energy has several devices and uh, several security mechanisms. Uh, so pairing, uh, there's three types. There's just works, and you see it's a trademark because it doesn't just work. Uh, <laughs> passcode and uh, add a band. So add a band by far is the most secure. You have to have, a, you have, to have the keys ahead of time or use some other method to get them. Uh, addressing is the MAC address on the Bluetooth device. Uh, there's public, which is one that you can register with the IEEE, and it's static, never changes, and there's random where the MAC address will change every time. Most phones have a random one, um, some do not. Or it'll generate a random MAC for each connection. 
So, and the third thing is encryption. So what makes Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth sniffing so difficult is there are 40 channels on the 2.4 gigahertz range, which is the same that wireless runs on. And three of those channels are used for advertising. And the other ones, the other 37, are used for data. So you advertise on one of the three channels. Uh, you'll, in, in order to see it, you'll have to be on that same channel. Your device will be listening for it. So it, it hops, though. Um, there's a frequency hop in the SPED spectrum that uses that, that uh, algorithm there for people who like math to bounce between um, the frequencies. And if you're trying to track it on a cheap $30 device, they don't work too well. So once you do get it working, though, uh, and here's an example of a Bluetooth advertisement. And you'll see there are advertising packets, and they're each different. I'm not going to bore you with it, because it's really boring. Um, so security procedures are in the pairing, bonding, and then encryption reestablishment. So the first piece of the security comes out of the generic access profile. Um, it's what defines how the interconnection is going to work. So you have two security modes, um, encryption and data signing. And they're both optional, and they're hard, and why do it if you don't have to, right? So there's also one thing that requires the device to have a name, a category type, like uh, the phone, a watch, a DOM. Um, I actually don't believe there's one listed in there, but I think they need to add one for DOM and connection parameters. So the GAT is what stores all the data that the device has. Um, there's a UUID, a long string, that says where the, this data lives on this DOM, or watch, or phone, or whatever. And it's requested by the master, and the value is returned by the slave. But the master and the slave, in that case, are interchangeable, because the, the DOM can actually ask the phone for uh, information, too. So this is a Wireshark PCAP of data sent written to the DOM. And you'll see that there's a value here listed, and that becomes important here in a second. Um, so overall, the vulnerabilities we identified um, that can happen are man in the middle. So you can essentially make your device act as a DOM, can have the person or the person in the other room connect to your device, and you can connect to their device instead and issue commands. So with uh, session hijacking, uh, similar thing, you spoof the MAC address on the device, and then the device that you're connecting to doesn't know who you are. And then denial of service with anything, you send a bunch of packets to it, and this thing, as you might imagine, can't handle that much. So it just falls over really quickly, or falls out, whatever you want. <laughs> um, so, data privacy and security concerns, uh, like I said, mention all of those things, they're all they're all issues, and the thing with collecting ages, childbirth dates, how it happened, who was there, is it circumcised, I don't, ever think, I don't know, lots of questions. So some of the mitigations are uh, the security modes. Like I said, they're not required to be enforced, but enforcing them adds very little work, but you get a lot of extra security out of the deal. Uh, MAC address randomization. So when this thing broadcasts, and we'll show that in a second, it tells you what it is. So there's no guessing. So you can just, if you see it anywhere, then you probably should leave it alone. Um, and then the advertisement type is uh, not important for security. Um, so we'll have a little demonstration. We recorded them, um, so, we'll, so we'll get them here. So this one is a capture, um, and let's see if it works. So we click the device. And then we're going to filter it down by the MAC address through the eyeball. And you'll see it's a Texas instrument device. We're going to follow it, and you'll see the, you'll see here in a second the connection. A connection request is made after it's advertising. And then a bunch of data handling happens. And then when you turn on the app, there'll be some write commands. So then this is a uh, replay attack, um, just running. Uh, the command BLE replay uh, with a file that was collected. And I'll show you a video here of what it does. So you see here that with the computer, we were able to control the device without needing the app. 
and then in order to change your MAC address, um, and this never works the first time, you will have to run it twice. So what you do is you get the device type or the device ID, you get the MAC address of the device, and I type the clear package twice. All right, there I go. So right here is the address that we want to spoof. We run the command, it'll fail, and then it works. Don't know why. And then when you go ahead and search again, we reset the device. And then we run the config again, see that the MAC address is now changed. All right, and so back to our initial questions here, and these are some good things to think about. Um, basically, the most important one is, can compromising devices such as these lead to sexual assault or harassment, um, especially since we just showed that uh, it can be controlled from a computer, possibly while someone's using it? Um, and then, is the vendor liable for the data loss um, that happens, like, when they have insecure API calls? Um, and then, is the information that's stored here considered to be health information? And then, just future takeaways. Um, obviously, we're going to continue to see more and more devices that are integrated into personal lives that are connected to the internet. Um, with that comes more information and more integrations with things that want your data and collect it, and lots of things happen with that data, as we know. Um, and then this will eventually call for a greater focus on security. We're already starting to see all sorts of things about security in the news almost daily. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, um, we didn't try to take down their stuff, um, but you can change that picture. Uh, it's just uh, base64 encoded. Um, so if you just take whatever you want, uh, threat butt, whatever you want to put up there. Does that have to be a photo? Uh, no, it can be anything that's base64 encoded, because I did try that. I did not see what it did, though. Um, I didn't want to go to prison. <laughs> what, what we did here is all public and nothing malicious, per se. So uh, I did was able to upload something other than a picture, um, and it did come back as something that wasn't a picture. But we did not; like, it was just a text file. But when you downloaded it back on through the API, it did drop the file on your computer. Um, was, was the uh, session ID random? Uh, Random-ish. It was mostly random. Um, there was some some ones that looked similar every time I ran it. I don't know what they were using um, as far as whatever their algorithm was. I see what you're saying. So, could we make this thing do something that the app couldn't do? Um, not that we tried. So, we, the app has several modes. Um, one is in the game, like I said, if you squeeze it, um, it tests the, uh, the how strong your hand is, right? That's what it does. Um, and it sends that data back to the phone. Okay, that's what this is for. Okay. Uh, as far as um, damage, so what, what the thing that we found was that when you connect to the device and say you're not wanting to use the device for vibration, you can turn it on without the user's knowledge. Um, which was the main concern for us with these types of products is using it in a way that the, not necessarily the device wasn't intended to use, but what the user did not want to, to be intended to use. So if you want the feature to see how strong your hand is, but you don't want it to vibrate in your hand, then you can turn that off and not use it. So turning it on without the user's consent, uh, we consider it the bad thing. So. In a, in a way, yes. In a way, no. Uh, we couldn't make it explode, and if we did, we'd only have one. I wasn't buying another one. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I guess another thing is, um, we looked at this device a little bit, like when we were looking at the PCAPs, um, and and we looked at the app, and there are like very specific, uh, like vibration codes and 
I guess, data codes that this will accept from a device, an end device. So we didn't try sending it anything random, but like along the process when we were trying to figure out what the vibration code was, it didn't seem like it would accept anything that it didn't recognize. Yeah, and uh, we didn't try any fuzzing as we learned last night. It's a thing that most developers don't do, and uh, they probably should. And we probably should have too to see kind of what happened, because uh, maybe it gets hot and there is a battery in it, which concerns me anyway. Um, could be a Samsung battery, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, we, we realize that this talk is not the most, uh, um, you know, child-friendly, uh, workplace-friendly. That's not, not, not safe for work, but, you know, I probably wouldn't give this presentation at work. <laughs> um, but we hope that you, everyone learns something and that in the future you'll think about your purchases and like I said, this one is no longer what it's called, so I'm not too concerned, but they have updated it. Maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't. Um, I'm not sure why they changed names, because it happened about a month after we contacted them, but they never contacted us back. I don't know what that means. I sent them an email. Uh, they don't know where it routed to. It was a weird email address. And I didn't hear anything back, and then a month later, it's no longer on the App Store. And the device that we thought it was, it looks like it changed its name. Or it could have just been another knockoff, who knows. Um, we see that often as a, maybe a copyright issue, or if there is copyright. We, we don't know who originated it, so we couldn't let them know, be like, hey, we think this is yours. Um, yeah, that's another issue for these types of devices, as they spring up out of nowhere and get sold on Amazon. Um, yeah, so if someone has any questions, thank you very much. Thank you.